tell me about these about these lovely sticky these cards. little sticky cards uh I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people that are tuned in have heard me uh, try to preach the gospel about sticky cards before but we do have our yellow and blue varieties out here helping us to monitor for pests the blue is mostly aimed for thrips, but you can see that we catch a lot of a lot more everything. than just the uh, thrips on there, including a, a shirt sleeve, every shirt once sleeve, in a, while. a couple of birds every now and then. Yeah, uh, the yellow ones are a bit more catch all. Those are going to get your aphids, your thrips, your white flies. Uh, they don't do so great with the mites. Tell uh, me about it. And unfortunately, that's very unfortunate <laughs> because that was kind of what snuck in here on us. We battled thrips hard and heavy earlier in the season. That was what uh, I have an undergrad. His name's Cooper King. He's been counting the pests that are on the cards, so we have that data, and it, he really learned what thrips were when he started. Yeah. He had never seen bugs before, really, uh, the way that we were te I was teaching him about them, and uh, he learned very quickly what thrips are. So they were hard and heavy early on. That seemed to break, though, would you say the end of June? Maybe kind of the beginning. Maybe kind of, of uh, yeah, maybe early July. That yeah. that was no longer our primary <laughs> problem. They got quickly replaced by what is a, apparently to me at least a spider mite problem. There is some russet mite damage. Rick Besson and I were walking around here earlier. There's also some, I don't know, maybe mystery stuff. That that over there, that's, that's weird. Probably leftover sclerotinia. Perfect. Okay. So I feel better than about Dr. being Goche like this. Will be, yeah, okay. Dr. Kochi will talk about that. But when we look at a lot of these leaves, I've picked one off of here. Maybe I can walk it closer to the camera for everybody to see. I don't want to. Yes. So one thing about these sticky cards. So are you telling me that I shouldn't leave the same sticky card oh. up all year <laughs> You're long? You're right. I didn't complete my thought on that. Uh, no. When you put a sticky card out, <laughs> if you put it out in April and then collect it in October, you've really kind of wasted the card and your time and your money because these aren't traps. They're not here necessarily to help suppress pest populations. These are strictly passive monitoring tools. These are there when you aren't collecting some of the pests that are invading the tunnel. Uh, and if you don't come and look at them at least every other week, uh, preferably you would do it every week, but we've all, we're not all made of time. We're not perfect. Yeah. Yep. So if you do it at least every other week, you'll get a good idea of what is coming into the tunnel and keeping records of that will give you the ability to kind of predict year to year, maybe when you need to go out and put some biocontrol agents in, you know that you seem to get this pest pressure every eighth, uh, April, uh, maybe 29th or something like that, so that you know that maybe you should begin thinking about it then or get a spray out. Uh, but yeah, you got to hang these up. We have the very fancy and sophisticated uh, double, uh, what are these called? Closed, closed pin. Yes, yes, closed pin method. Can't believe I forgot the word closed pin. Uh, I've but, invested lots of money. Yeah. In pins. Well, and then you you glue them together so that uh, there's yep. a couple of you can glue two two sides together. Yeah. Um, use some really good glue. Yes. Uh, not Elmer's. Not Elmer's, wood but glue, like a, gorilla some, glue. Yeah, gorilla glue type situation, and they they hold pretty well. Yep. Um, and they fit really well on rebar or, you know, the edge of a T-post, right? Yep. They, they, they can withstand some, some decent wind. I would also invest in some citrusol type uh, hand soap <laughs> with some yeah. orange oil yeah. in there that will they, help you to dissolve. Seriously sticky. But yeah, you need to take them down. When we collect them, uh, we either wrap these in saran wrap so that we can handle it and take it elsewhere. Uh, sandwich baggies also work really well. We switched to the sandwich bag method. It's a great method. Yes. Yeah. So you just drop them in there and it, it is a little reflective, but it helps you to not get it all over your hand and you can casually look at what's on there. You will catch some things that you don't intend. Here's a, a butterfly that's unfortunately wandered in. It is a, a yellow, so it's not exactly rare or anything, <laughs> but we have caught bees on these and things of that nature, right. but they're very important for the monitoring process, which is the the foundational bedrock of a pest management ipm program for invertebrate so not pests. a trap not a trap unfortunately I yeah mean, i get that they question trap pests right they are sh should it's, not be used as traps. it is not going to catch enough to suppress them <laughs> okay, uh, it right. would get real thick on there yes. if, they, if they did right uh, but the other problem is they don't catch everything that's how things like mites kind of sneak up on you yeah if show I us get... what these uh, mites can do this is stippling where's how's it look good so stippling is this kind of pixelation that you see on the leaf. This was most likely two spotted spider mite. They're one of the easier mites to see in a high tunnel situation. Uh, as the name implies, they have two spots on them. We're very boring in entomology when we name things. Uh, they are larger than the other mite species that could pop up. So they're usually visible to the naked eye. They may also leave behind webbing 
that you can find uh, kind of accumulating on the plant in a big time pest situation like we see here. So this is quite a bit of damage. They love this heat and dry that we've had in recent weeks and their populations are just always going to explode when we have those sort of droughty conditions. So they got into this tunnel and it just, it damaged. they went ham. Yeah. <laughs> in basically the course of what I would say was a, a week. Yeah. Right. They went from, huh, what's that? To, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? <laughs> the, how are we going right. to finish this project? Yeah. Um, so they really can take the plant down. And ID 36, the publication about vegetable production has a lot of good registered miticides and insecticides that can help with these kinds of problems. Russet mites, another one that pops up in tomato situations. Uh, depending on what you're growing, you might also see broad mite. The, the mites are always tough because they're not insects. So therefore not all insecticides are going to help protect, protect against them. There are some like bifenthrin that will get them. But other than that, you're really going to be looking at things like abamectin and other miticides. Yeah. That... And pay attention to the pre-harvest interval yes. and the re-entry interval, because what we had to use to get this under control had a very lengthy pre-harvest interval. Yes. Always read the label. Make sure yeah. that what you're treating is on the label. Make sure that it's uh, allowed registered. in a high tunnel. Yep. Greenhouses means a high tunnel, right? right? So uh, there are products out there. And if your problem isn't brought under control by the first one, you need to switch your IRAC class, the, the insecticide class, uh, check those numbers that are on there and make sure that your follow-up treatment is a different one. Otherwise you will breed super mites, dynamites. <laughs> dynamites. Uh, that will be able to kind of shrug off that one that you keep uh, repeatedly applying. They'll develop resistance to a mutant will pop up and she won't be able to be killed by it. And she'll pass those genes on. And eventually we kill out all of her competition anyway. So all that's left are those mutant ones that are now resistant to the product. We want to avoid that if at all possible. So one, a couple of things for maybe people should keep in mind is, so the leaves that you showed, right? The damage, that's not going to be fixed. No, that's right? That leaf is going <laughs> to look like that for the rest of its life. Right. What you want to look at is the new growth, yep. right? And what we have here Right, it's a floppy tomato yeah, plant, but, but it does look healthy. Yeah, you right? recovered quite well. It's recovered. Um, so keep that in mind, right? Those older leaves that are already damaged, they are going to continue to look damaged. What you want to focus on is the new growth. And as you can see, right, we've got some nice, healthy leaves. And so we did recover, yep. but there's I don't wish that on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been captivated the la this year and last year coming into these tunnels. You have this like tantalizing population of what are called stilt bugs. I took a picture yes. earlier. Uh, there's one hanging out right on the stem in front of me. I, they're extremely quick. Uh, so I don't know that I could transport it to the camera, but their name is quite evocative of what they look like. They are a true bug. So they look basically like an aphid with extra long twiggy legs that stick a out. A larger aphid. Yes, a bigger aphid. Yeah. There's one hanging out on this uh, almost ripe tomato here that's more uh, of an adult and we can see it the wings did. on it. Oh, yep. it just flew away. They're really fast. So they always get away from me. I always want to catch these because these have popped up in tomato production and high tunnels in multiple other states. Are There's, they friend or foe? They are foe because they feed on the plant. They suck juices out. So they'd be causing damage very similar to the aphids that we deal with but there isn't any data on what insecticides are actually effective against them. I mean, we can hazard a guess that contact products are going to work, but it's always best to figure that out. So right. I wanna get enough to uh, do some evaluations with them, but whenever I catch them, they live for about a day in captivity. They refuse to feed on the tomatoes I provide ah. them. Uh, and I haven't been able to do that. They're feral. Yes. So if you if you hear from anybody that has weird long-legged bugs on their plants, I uh -oh. would love to try and You're going to get all kinds of bugs now. <laughs> I mean, that's our life. That's our life. Uh, as long as it's not ticks and stuff. <laughs> uh, so, and the other thing is you may notice that these plants look very short for this time of year. And again, I think we're out of that honeymoon period where we're starting to see some soil complications. So we are testing twice uh before planting after planting uh after taking the tomatoes out after then um the next rotational crop and we're kind of tracking that and so we are already at year three seeing some serious soil fertility 
imbalances and weirdness, um, which again will come up, I can address more in detail with a, a PowerPoint to demonstrate at the fruit and vegetable conference. So um, just so people are aware, the tomatoes, these are BHN 589, and I would expect them to be about as tall as me or close to that this time of year, given how much time has gone by. 